Um, so I'm Chad Bound from Peterson. <coughs> As I full screen um, get set up here. So I will uh, talk a little bit about this from from uh, an economist's perspective, but I think uh, much of the the points that I'm going to make are going to be very much in line with the the, the priorities and perspectives that that James um, presented. Um, so as I was beginning to think about the WTO dispute settlement over the next couple of years, I, I, I thought, as economists like to do models, you know, sort of a taxonomy of, of all the things out there. Uh, and I came up with my list, you know, a month ago, uh, and then things happened, and I came up with a longer list. And then last week happened, and I came up with an even longer list. So I'm, af I'm afraid to check Twitter right now to see what I, I may have missed that would have already put this out of date. Um, so I guess the first question, though, that, that, that came to mind, and I think this will be one of the first things that we will uh, be able to, to potentially track uh, from, from the new administration, is the simple question of will President Trump continue to pursue uh, the already ongoing disputes, right? So the Obama administration initiated a number of cases uh, that, it, that it hasn't wrapped up. These things taken a long time to, to get uh, adjudicated. Uh, and there's a number that are, that are still in the pipeline that have to be potentially dealt with. And so the, the question of will, will the Trump administration uh, just take the baton and continue to pursue these? Or for some reason, will they say, nope, these are not a priority. You know, we're not going to deal with these. So what are these? Uh, well, it was the one on the, the last day or second to last day against Canada, which was really interesting about uh, wines and, and, and grocery stores in British Columbia. Um, so we'll see. I don't know what that was about. But clearly, the rest of them are about China, right, uh, and, and dealing with spe specific issues with China. Um, the two in the middle are about agriculture. So these are the, the kind of complementary cases on uh, rice, wheat, and corn for, for uh, excessive subsidies uh, to farmers, but then also uh, discriminatory treatment of imports through, through uh, the tariff rate quota system. Um, but then the other two, I think, are, are really fascinating, right? Uh, the, the aluminum subsidies case, which was sort of on the way out the door for the Obama administration, was, was I think, an important potential dispute, and it will be interesting to see uh, if the Trump administration continues with this one. Uh, if we think that a major problem with China is uh, state-owned enterprises, the changing nature over the last decade or so of, of, of the Chinese economy, uh, you know, even though they're shifting out of state-owned enterprises, potentially the form in which the Chinese government continues to be engaged in in economic activity uh, through a different mechanism, um, you know, it raises a number of questions, and I'll come back to that. But all that being said, if the main problems with China are are subsidies and things of that nature, from an economist's perspective, it's rather refreshing to see a WTO challenge of the subsidy itself, as opposed to the United States using countervailing duties to just stop the imports from coming in. They don't actually, you know, then the onus gets shifted on the United States as the import restricting uh, policy imposing country and, and not the underlying problem, which is the subsidies in the first place, right? So it'll be interesting to see if the Trump administration pursues that one. And then the other one is the, is the, the second raw materials case, uh, which is, again, an interesting case. Um, to try to explain to the Trump administration, so this is uh, Chinese export restrictions on raw materials, right? Very well-known things like molybdenum and, and cobalt and, yeah, I don't know what any of these, these, these minerals and things are either. But the critical issue here is we don't actually import enough of these things from China, right? China has export restrictions. We want to import more of these into the United States. Why? Well, we don't really make them ourselves. We don't mine them ourselves too much anymore. Uh, and China has export restrictions on this, which are making them too expensive for U.S. manufacturers to be able to access these things, to be able to compete in advanced manufacturing, especially electronics, aerospace, et cetera, with other competitors globally out there around the world, and in particular, potentially Chinese manufacturing firms that get to purchase these things domestically at a, at a lower price, right? That's a complicated economic argument that really goes counter to the narrative of the incoming administration, so we'll have to see if they're interested in pursuing that that type of dispute or not. Okay. Uh, will President Trump pursue a new approach to dispute settlement? Um, and I have up here file new and more aggressive and potentially riskier types of cases against China. And again, my read of this as a potentially yes is very much in line with the, with the statements that, that James just put up there uh, about Lighthizer's testimony back in 2010. And so I read uh, those paragraphs the exact same way, which was to suggest the United States uh, may be feeling a little bit too constrained in terms of the policies that it's been imposing over the years, trying to live up to these WTO uh, commitments that aren't really religious obligations, and we should allow ourselves to do more. Uh, 
Uh, and the things that we might do more of, uh, you know, on the on the import restriction side, we might impose import restrictions and try to justify it under a, a balance of payments types of exception, um, um, or the the kind of the, the the currency story, the exchange arraignment kind of story. Okay, uh, we might think about pursuing disputes on currency, though, as Jay explained to us very articulately this morning, and Steve as well. Right now, that really doesn't really seem to carry much, all that much water, but you know, who knows what might go on there. But there are also sort of these uh, larger and, and, and different types of disputes, you know, that one could imagine filing, especially against a country like China, where it's really hard to pinpoint exactly what it is that they have done wrong or to find the evidence of it. But you know there's something there, right? And you can show that it's, it's actually hurt us in some sort of tangible ways in the United States. So maybe there are these kind of non-violation complaints that you could bring, which is a provision of, of GATT and WTO law. Um, the question comes up, well, what would be the hook? Um, how would how would do this? But I, but I when I read Lighthizer's testimony, I read that as, you know, USTR has just been far too constrained over the last 20 years of the types of disputes they've been willing to bring. We should take some chances, right? That's sort of an optimistic view, I think. Um, and But maybe we'll see that, right? Maybe we will see the United States bringing disputes forward uh, that we aren't necessarily guaranteed slam dunk to win on the on the legal arguments. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but it's a potentially uh, a, a change in that direction. Okay. How about on the defensive side? Well, uh, President Trump inherits a number of, of ongoing uh, disputes that trading partners have initiated against the United States. Now, you might think, well, obviously, he'll continue to defend the United States against these disputes. Um, We'll see, right? Uh, you know, I think there's a number of really, really important ones out there. Uh, there's a number of challenges that, that are still in the pipeline, either panel, the appellate body uh, phase, uh, or, or, or other elements of compliance, addressing uh, how the United States trade remedy laws that we talked about this morning have been evolving. Uh, and especially this idea that since 2007 or so, uh, the United States has started using not only anti-dumping with respect to imports from China, but also countervailing duties, perhaps under recognition that someday, uh, and that was in some interpretations uh, uh, December 11th of last year, but someday, since we didn't do it then, uh, China might have to be granted market economy status, and that might change how they're treated under, under anti-dumping law. So this again feeds into this issue of, well, how big a deal is non-market economy status to the United States? And is this, uh, is this something, uh, this is obviously another dispute that, that the United States has to deal with since uh, right after the, the December 11th deadline, China filed formal disputes against both the U.S. and European Union on the issue. So, you know, where does the United States stand on this one? How big of a deal is it? Um, if we were to just simply uh, grant China market economy status, would that lead to a flood of, of imports coming into the United States, or would there be other things that, that could be done? So I'd done some work on this last year, uh, and so this little chart, what it shows you is three things. Uh, the light blue line, so that's the share of U.S. imports over time that are kind of sitting under anti-dumping duties. So these are imports from China that are affected by anti-dumping and duties that are relatively high because of, of the non-market economy distinction, which, which gives uh, the Commerce Department certain, certain authority to uh, use alternative methods. And what you see there is, you know, as of at the end of 2015, it's a little bit higher now, but at the end of 2015, arguably, you know, 7% of imports, U.S. imports from China, affected by uh, anti-dumping. Um, if you were automatically take all of those anti-dumping orders away, uh, you know, would that lead to a surge in imports coming in from China? Well, first of all, I would argue that simply taking away or, or eliminating non-market economy status isn't going to eliminate the orders. It will reduce the size of the duties that are imposed, so there'll still be some anti-dumping duties there. But even beyond that, the red dotted line shows you all of the simultaneous countervailing duty cases that have been brought against imports from China of the same exact products, essentially, at the same exact time. And so you see basically this convergence. And so even eliminating the anti-dumping duties uh, still would leave significant protection on imports from China under the countervailing duty law. So just as an economic matter, yes, it might tie our hands in terms of the trade remedy regimes, but commerce has in many respects, anticipated this day and and armed themselves by giving themselves access to this alternative instrument. Now, some of this is currently still under challenge at the WTO, and so we're not sure that what commerce has been doing in this direction will be, you know, will withstand the pellet body and and sort of compliance procedures, but potentially. But I think this is a this is a sort of dispute to keep an eye on as well. 
uh, to see how the, the Trump administration treats this one. Okay. Uh, and then my last one, uh, and I hadn't th thought about this at all uh, before a month ago, and then, you know, leading up to about a week ago, I began to think about it a little bit. And then on Thursday of last week, I started to think about it a lot. Uh, and so, uh, well, that's obviously, there's the unilateral trade policy actions that, that James has already discussed, but this, the border adjustment tax is what I want to talk about for, for a minute. Um, and so, as James mentioned, this is, a, this, is a, this is a critical feature of the Ryan Brady blueprint from uh, June 2016 that is now all abuzz. Uh, it has this destination-based cash flow tax uh, element in it, which includes a border tax adjustment component, right? Uh, now, when economists assess this in general, they think about this initially from the perspective of a value-added tax scheme, and, and you know, 150 or, or so countries around the world have those sorts of tax uh, schemes in place where they have these border adjustments. And so the question arises, when you adjust uh, taxes at the border to not allow imports to be deductible, but to allow export sales and revenues to, to receive deduction, is that discriminatory, right? Does that lead to either national treatment concerns or sort of export subsidy concerns? In the traditional economic analysis of this stuff under VATS, the answer is no. I mean, when you, when you think about this and you allow for exchange rates to adjust and prices to adjust over the long run, these things do not have competitive effects, right? That would be the standard economic argument. The issue in the, the, the Ryan Brady plan is it's not a pure value added tax, as we've heard folks already mention. Um, you know, our economists will argue that, well, you know, I know it's, it's, it's still, it's a cash flow tax and not a value added tax. And there is this distinction between the, the re tax, taxing the revenue and a product that, that the GATT and WTO scholars will, uh, will, will point to. But economically, conceptually, it is still almost the same. Right in terms of, of how economists would think about it, with the one exception, which is uh, it has this wage deduction component to it right now, right, and and that possibility, economists would argue, over the long run, provided prices and exchange rates are flexible, should not have pro or anti-competitive effects, um, but in the short run, before prices and stuff are allowed to adjust, could actually end up being discriminatory, right, and so. That's what I'm going to argue here: is that this could very lead, could very well lead to, if not addressed um, in thinking hard about this from the international cooperation perspective, WTO consistency. This could very well lead to a, a significant uh, WTO dispute. Um, so let me just talk through that. So the way I'm going to assess this is to, is to just work all the way backward from how big a dispute this might be. And so this is just you know some some basic facts for those of you that don't think about WTO dispute settlement all the time. There have been 500 of these cases started since the, the system went into place. The U.S. is incredibly involved in this system. More than 100 cases it's brought forward, been the target of more than 100 cases as well. Um, all that being said, in the entire system, there's only been 13 cases that have actually reached the stage of retaliation being authorized. So where the WTO judges, arbitrators in these kinds of cases figure out if you still refuse to get rid of this thing that we have found you to have done wrong, by how much we're going to allow trading partners to retaliate against you, right? And that's what we're really, that's what I'm gonna think about here, right? Suppose we were to implement this tax, it has the border adjustment component to it, would we really be concerned that countries would actually retaliate in ways that we would care about, care about or maybe we just you know, don't worry about that kind of thing? So of those 13, the U.S. has been involved in, in a number of those. Uh, it's brought two of those itself against the Europeans, the, the beef hormones and the banana cases, and been the, the target of seven. Uh, to put it into context, the largest retaliation award in one of those cases is $4 billion. And so this is the foreign sales corporation case that the Europeans brought. The smallest is the Canadian version of the beef hormone case. And the most recent one was the country of origin labeling ruling case that uh, regulation case that Canada and Mexico brought against the U.S., which was about a billion dollars, right? Uh, and this is a billion dollars in essentially lost trade if you're using one type of formula that the WTO loses, right? And another type could be the size of the subsidy. But just keep those numbers in mind. The biggest one ever, $4 billion. Okay. So what I want to do is to walk through, I want you to pretend now that you're the WTO judges looking at the border adjustment uh, tax component of the Ryan Brady plan and a potential dispute that might be sitting in front of you brought by trading partners. Let's just call trading partners everybody out there in the world, all the exporters to the United States of the world. Uh, and the United States loses its case 
right? So we've heard some arguments about why the United States might lose the case. The United States refuses to comply, says, eh? And we're going to figure out what the retaliation is going to be, okay? So now I'm the arbitrators that are tasked with doing this. And the way that I'm going to do it first is to use what's called the trade effects formula, which is the lost export revenue associated with this type of import restriction. Okay, so let me walk us through this, the, how I get these numbers. So the U.S. in 2016, just in terms of goods, had about $2.2 trillion in imports from the world. Okay. Uh, let's suppose the Ryan Brady border tax adjustment on imports is 20%. Now, that in and of itself isn't discriminatory. What ends up being discriminatory and sort of the national treatment violating part of this is really going to be the wage deduction, okay? And let's suppose that that, you know, there's that's variance there, differentiation across sectors, but maybe on average the, the, that it's about 50% uh, across, so 50% of the costs of these firms in the United States are labor costs, essentially. So let's just suppose that translates into what's kind of the equivalent of a 50% of 20% or a 10% import tax. That would be the net, the sort of the national treatment violation, the import restriction. Uh, okay, fine. Well, then the, the, the WTO looks at, well, how much lost trade is associated with a 10% uh, U.S. import tax relative to the counterfactual of that thing not being in place? So let's walk through some math on that. Now, I'm going to assume a trade elasticity of one, which is very conservative as my uh, expert trade economist friends, some of which are sitting in this audience, would, 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 would say. The number should be more like three, but let's just assume it's one. If it's one, uh, you increase the tariff by 10%. We, that would mean U.S. real imports fall by 10%, which off of $2.2 trillion is about $220 billion. Okay? That's the amount by which trading partners would be authorized to retaliate in this case. Right? Now, what was the number I said the biggest retaliation to date had been? Four billion, right? Two hundred and twenty billion. Okay, but that might not be all, right? That's just assuming they 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 think it's an import restricting violation. What if they also think that it's an export subsidy, right? Well, the the WTO and the cases so far that have looked at these export subsidy cases, and there's been four of these or so on the on the subsidy side, they use a slightly different method. They don't look at the lost trade associated with the subsidy, but they look at the actual size of the subsidy itself, the payments that are made under the subsidy. So if I gotta work through the math on this one, the same basic conservative assumptions, you would get for an export subsidy to dispute, uh, the US goods exports are $150 billion higher because of this subsidy, uh, and, and, and they reach 1.65 trillion in total. The trading partner gets to retaliate over 10% of that. There's another $165 billion worth of retaliation. So now the trading partners collectively are, they can get authorized to retaliate over $385 billion of, of U.S. trade, right? As opposed to $4 billion in the biggest case so far, which is FISC, right? So clearly this is going to blow up the system and is unrealistic to think it would ever get there. Now you might say, well, no one would ever do this by themselves, right? No, the United States is the big player in the system. It would likely blow things up. And so, you know, well, but we've seen lots of examples of multi-country cases brought, Right, under the under the WTO. We've brought some. We've brought cases against Europe, for example, uh, in the banana cases. We brought cases against China on, on rare earths and raw materials with Europeans, Japan, Mexico, et cetera. We've had them brought against us, steel safeguard, nine countries, uh, bird amendment, uh, shrimp sea turtle back in the day, right? So it's not unheard of to imagine, you know, any single country might be scared of the United States, quote unquote, but they might collectively decide to, to come together. Um, but even if they wanted to go on a, go against the United States on their own, would it be in their interest? So I do the math on that. And yeah, there's, you know, our major trading partners in terms of who exports the most to us, where does this $200 billion, $220 billion come from? Well, the usual suspects, right? Who you would expect. China, under this scenario, could be authorized to retaliate by $46 billion. Mexico, $30 billion. The European Union, $42 billion. And the issue is, all it takes is one of these countries, right? Because... If they bring a dispute, they win, they got authorized to retaliate, the United States can't buy them off by compensating, by just sort of getting rid of the border adjustment on their stuff, on their exports to the United States. Because if you did that, then there'd be an additional violation, right? An MFN violation where if you only bought off the Europeans in Mexico or you know nobody else had brought a dispute, everybody else would then have a subsequent dispute to be able to bring against you, okay? So it seems to me this is just you know something to think about for the crafters of of, of tax reform. Um,
And so I, I leave with this statement, countries would never bring a border tax adjustment dispute because they're afraid President Trump would pull the United States out of the WTO. Um, I'll argue that statement is wrong um, for a couple of reasons. And so this is, you know, typically, frequently, you hear this argument that, well, you know, as we're thinking about implementing different types of, of legislation or uh, doing different trade policy actions, whether it's the, the Bush Steel Safeguard of 2002 that we heard about earlier or, or the Obama administration uh, tire safeguard, we can, get a, we can do this, we can get away with it for a period of time, there'll be a dispute, uh, we'll ultimately maybe found, be found to get rid of this thing, though the Obama administration did not, um, and, 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 but we get two or three years of protection, right, and, and before we have to, and that helps solve the political problem. That's not the right way to think about this case, right? Because you, you can't just sort of pay off any one country that would bring a case against you. Um, for the crafters of this legislation at this moment in time, you don't do tax reform frequently, right? You do tax reform once a generation. Last time we did something this big was in the 1980s, right? We don't want to do this again. Uh, so you want to get it right the first time. And politics change, right? The way the dispute settlement process plays itself out, it may be a couple of years before you get to the appellate you know, body decisions, but then you've got a compliance panel, uh, then you've got the reasonable period of time. All of a sudden, you're no longer perhaps with this president, right? There's, we have elections every four years. Uh, you may not be with this Congress, right? And so if you're drafting the legislation now, you really don't want to play fast and loose with international obligations, I would argue, uh, because when you're, you're forced to reopen this thing uh, four or five years from now, you could find yourself in a very different political setting. So. My cause is to them, please try to get it right the first time if you possibly can. So talk to our lawyer friends here to make it as uh, WTO consistent as possible. With that, I'll stop. Thanks.